This program is brought to you by the faithful support of the friends and partners of Rick Renner Ministries. Welcome to today's program with Rick Renner. Let's join Rick for a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Welcome to the program. My name is Rick Renner, and I've been waiting for you. And today, I'm believing you're going to get something brand new from the Bible, especially as we're studying the gifts of the Holy Spirit and why we need them. And today, you're going to clearly see why we need the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We've already spent three programs talking about the history of the Corinthian church, why the Corinthians had so many problems of carnality, and we established it had nothing to do with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Then in program number two, we looked at the grace of God and what the grace of God does when it's poured out in our life. And the grace of God always comes with some kind of outward, visible demonstration or manifestation. Then in the last program, we looked at the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Exactly what are they? How are they defined? How do you explain the gifts of the Holy Spirit, especially as they're described in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we saw that all the gifts of the Spirit were at operation in the church at Corinth. And today, we're going to continue, and we're going to see what the gifts of the Spirit actually do for us. What kind of benefit do they bring to the church? We know they bring a benefit because in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, Paul says, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. That word profit is the word for a benefit. So contrary to the teaching of some, that the gifts of the Holy Spirit make us silly or foolish or carnal, Paul says explicitly in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7, they bring a profit, they bring a benefit to the church. Now, maybe you grew up in a traditional church like I grew up, and I'm very grateful for the church I grew up in. They taught me many wonderful things, but there were a few things they taught me that were incorrect. And one thing they taught me was that it was wrong to seek spiritual gifts. In fact, we were told that this was really a manifestation of spiritual silliness to seek after spiritual gifts. But what does the Bible say? The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1, follow after love and desire spiritual gifts. Let's analyze that verse just for a moment. No one would argue about the first part of the verse that says follow after love. That word follow is a Greek word, dioko, which means hotly pursue. We are to be pursuing, we're to be chasing, ardently following after love, having loving relationships and learning how to walk in love. And no one would argue with that part of the verse. We all know that Christ commands us to walk in love. But if you're going to accept the first part of the verse, you have to also accept the second part of the verse because the second part of the verse is a part of the same verse. And in the second part of the verse, Paul says, desire spiritual gifts. The word desire is the Greek word zeteo, which means to boil over with jealousy to have something. It is the intense desire to obtain something until finally it is completely yours. This is the word which Paul uses when he says to the church, desire spiritual gifts. Contrary to the teaching that it's carnal or silly to seek after spiritual gifts, Paul says, pursue them. In the same verse that he says, follow after love, he also says, desire spiritual gifts. Just like it's right for us to walk in love, it is right, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1, for us to desire spiritual gifts. Now, I want us to look at a very important verse in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26, where Paul tells us something very important about the operation of spiritual gifts. And he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26, how is it then, brethren, when you are come together, every one of you, again, every one, the Greek word hekestos, it's an all-embracing term, it includes everyone. So Paul says everyone in the church at Corinth was operating in spiritual manifestations or in spiritual gifts. This is not something given just to the special or the elite, but God's intention according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, is that the manifestation of the Spirit be given to every man. Again, the Greek word hekestos, this all-encompassing term that includes everyone that is born again. Now, when you come to 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26, Paul uses this word hekestos, again, every man. Listen to what he says. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you, there it is, hekestos, 
every one of you has a psalm, has a doctrine, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Or we find there were so many gifts of the Holy Spirit operating in the church at Corinth, they were literally bubbling over with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Their meetings were so exciting. One, according to Paul, had a psalm, another had a doctrine, another a tongue, another revelation, another had an interpretation. The gifts of the Holy Spirit were literally spilling over when they came together in their public assemblies. Paul just gives one primary rule that he wants us to remember. He says, let all things be done unto edifying. Now, what most traditional churches have a problem with is when it seems that services that are charismatic or Pentecostal in nature are disorderly. They don't understand the disorderly nature of some Pentecostal and charismatic services. Well, order is determined locally by every congregation and by every pastor. But there's one general rule that is important for us to adapt, and it's found in this word edification. In 1 Corinthians 14, 26, Paul says, let all things be done unto edification. The first thing he says is let all things be done. There's no restriction here against the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Paul doesn't say you can't do it. In fact, the first thing he says is let, let it all be done. You can do all of it. He just tells us it all has to be done for edification. The word edification is an architectural term, and it described an architect who designed a plan, and once he had the plan, then he began to enlarge or he began to amplify his house or the building that he was adding on to. In order for an architect to build a building, he has to have a plan. And with the plan, if he follows it very carefully and builds according to the plan, then he's able to begin to enlarge the house. He's able to amplify the building. And finally, they increase their space and they successfully build a new structure. This is an architectural term. And that's the word edification. And in this term, Paul gives us a basic rule. When we come together to worship, even when we come together to operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we shouldn't be haphazard in the way we do it. No one builds a house haphazardly. An architect and a builder builds according to a plan. And likewise, in the house of God, things should have a plan. There should be a time for worship, a time for the word, a time for the moving of the spirit. We should have a plan that we follow so the haphazardness of this is removed. Remember, God is a God of order. And in fact, in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40, Paul says everything should be done decently and what? In order. There should be a plan. And the purpose of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is edification, or it should enlarge us spiritually. It should amplify our understanding of Jesus. The gifts of the Holy Spirit never take away from us, but the gifts of the Holy Spirit always amplify us. They enlarge us. They make us better. They make us bigger. That's what the gifts of the Holy Spirit do when they're really allowed to operate among us. And that takes us back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where Paul is going to tell us what the gifts of the Holy Spirit do among us. And listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's begin again in verse 4, where he describes the grace of God. He says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. Then in verse 5, he describes how the grace manifested among them. He says that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. We saw this word enriched is the Greek word plusias. The word plusias describes one that has vast wealth, unlimited wealth. And Paul says that the Corinthian church was enriched in Christ. Interesting that when it says you are enriched in him, the word en is the Greek word en spelled en. And in this verse, it can be translated two ways. It can be translated, you are enriched in him, or it can be translated, you are enriched by him. And actually, both of these would be correct translations. First of all, it tells us the day we were placed in Christ was the richest day we've ever had in our life. In that day, when we were placed in Christ, we became spiritually rich. But it can also be translated, you are enriched by him, which describes our ongoing relationship. You continually are lavished. You continue to be enriched by your relationship with him. Because you're in him, you continue to be made more rich. So we were made rich the day we were placed into Christ. And by abiding in Christ, we are continually made richer. 
the Greek word plusias, which here is translated enriched, really you could say it describes filthy, stinking riches. This is someone who has so much money, so much wealth, they're not even able to tabulate how much they have. That's what has been given to us in Christ. We have been enriched the day we were placed in him, and we are continually enriched because we abide in him. But Paul then mentions specifically how these riches manifested. He says, in all utterance and in all knowledge. And here he's describing the utterance gifts of the Holy Spirit and the knowledge gifts of the Holy Spirit. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are manifesting among the Corinthians. And Paul says, these are evidences of the grace of God and these are spiritual riches which are teeming, spilling over in your midst. Then in verse 6, Paul tells us what the gifts of the Holy Spirit concretely do for you, what they do for your church. Listen to what he says in verse 6. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed among you. There are two key words in verse 6, the word testimony and the word confirmed. The word testimony is the Greek word marturias, and the word marturias is the Greek word which described one who gave a testimony in a court of law. He would stake his life for his testimony. He wasn't speaking secondhand information because secondhand information is not admitted into a court of law. He was speaking from what he personally knew himself. This was his personal experience. This was his personal firsthand knowledge. The word confirmed is the Greek word bibaios. The word bibaios means to authenticate, to verify, to guarantee, to establish, or to make something concrete. To make something concrete. Now, I'm going to explain the meaning of these words, but first, I'm going to give you a little story. When my wife and I first moved to the Soviet Union many, many decades ago, I went to a museum and I was looking at the paintings, and particularly looking at some paintings by Dutch masters. And there was a painting of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Now remember at that time, the Soviet Union had just ended and communism was still king. And so there were symptoms and remnants of communism still in existence. And as I was looking at this painting and other paintings about the parables and the acts of Jesus, I was particularly looking at a painting of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And when I read the little plate on the frame below the painting, it said the fairy tale of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. The fairy tale of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And it really struck me. They're calling this a fairy tale. To them, it fit in the same category as Peter Pan or Snow White or some other fairy tale. This was the fairy tale of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And as I stood and looked at that painting and looked at that plate on the frame below the painting and read what it said, I began to think about people that grew up in traditional churches. And in a certain way, people who grew up in traditional churches have fairy tales about Jesus because they've never seen a miracle happen in front of their eyes. They've never seen a healing demonstrated in front of them. They have no idea what it's like when a demon is cast out of someone because in the traditional context of their church, that's prohibited. It's never taken place. They don't believe in it. So all of these things remain in the realm of the imagination or in the mind. They read about it in the Bible but it's kind of the figment of their imagination. They have to try to figure out what was that really like because they've never seen it, they've never experienced it. And so a certain way, Jesus multiplying the loaves and fishes is like a fairy tale. Or Jesus casting out a demon, it's like a fairy tale. It's something that happened in another time to someone else in another place. It's not something that we know today or have any experience with. It's a little bit like a fairy tale. And I begin to understand to a certain degree, that's how I had been when I was younger. To me, it was all in the realm of the imagination. However, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 6, when the gifts of the Holy Spirit are in operation, it does something for us. It takes what we know about Christ out of the realm of the imagination and brings it into reality. It takes it out of the realm of the imagination and authenticates it or makes it concrete right in front of us and that is what 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 6 says. Look at it again. 
even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Remember, in verse 5, he was talking about the manifestation of the grace of God in spiritual gifts, in all utterance and in all knowledge. You're spiritually rich with spiritual gifts. And then immediately he follows up in verse 6, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed among you. Well, what was and what is the testimony of Christ? The testimony of Christ is that he is a healer. The testimony of Christ, for example, is he is a miracle worker. The testimony of Christ, for example, is Jesus is a prophet. Jesus worked miracles. Jesus healed the sick. Jesus prophesied. He was a prophet. We know these concrete facts about Jesus. But when the gifts of the Holy Spirit are in operation, it leaves the mental realm and it enters into the real realm. It becomes concrete right in front of you. For example, when the gift of healing is in manifestation, you no longer wonder, gee, what was it like when Jesus healed the sick? You mentally believe that he was a healer, but because you've never seen it, you have to kind of imagine, hmm, I wonder what that would have been like. However, when the gift of healing is in manifestation, and you see it regularly manifested, it leaves the realm of the imagination and it becomes confirmed among you. It's real. You don't have to imagine what it was like when Jesus healed the sick because you have seen Jesus heal the sick. That testimony of Jesus that he is a healer is suddenly confirmed among you. You have experience with Jesus the healer. He's not just someone you believe in, but Jesus the healer is someone you personally know because you've experienced the gift of healing. The same would be true of the working of miracles. You know that Jesus worked miracles, and you might imagine what that was like 2,000 years ago. It can remain just in the realm of the imagination. However, when the working of miracles is at work in your life or in your church, it leaves the realm of the imagination and the testimony of Christ, what you believe doctrinally and intellectually about him, suddenly leaves the realm of the imagination and becomes actual. It becomes authenticated, verified, guaranteed, established, or the Greek word bibios, it becomes concrete. You now have experience with Jesus, the miracle worker. You don't have to imagine what it was like because you know what it was like. You've experienced that dimension of Christ. The same would apply to Jesus, the prophet. You know that Jesus was a prophet. You may have wondered, gee, I wonder what that was like, that Jesus was a prophet. Mentally, you may try to imagine it. If you've had no experience with the gift of prophecy, you have no option except to imagine it. It's just in the realm of the mind or the intellect. But when the gift of prophecy is in operation, it takes Christ out of the realm of the imagination. It takes him out of the mind of the intellect only, and it brings Christ right into our midst. So the testimony of Jesus the prophet is established. It is authenticated, verified, guaranteed. It is made concrete among us because the gift of prophecy brings to us that revelation practically Jesus was not just the prophet, but Jesus is still the prophet working among us. That is what the gifts of the Holy Spirit do. They bring us the reality of Christ. It leaves the doctrinal realm. It leaves the intellectual realm. It leaves the realm of the imagination. And the gifts of the Holy Spirit cause the testimony of Christ to be concrete, authenticated among us. This is so very vital. And it means there's a whole element of Jesus you will never understand apart from the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Thank God for our minds. Thank God for our imagination. Thank God for knowledge. But God doesn't want everything to remain in the realm of the imagination and the intellect only. God wants us to personally have experience with Jesus Christ. And that is what the gifts of the Holy Spirit bring to us according to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 6. I'll never forget the first time I saw a miracle. I, of course, I'd grown up in the church, was taught the Bible, but I'd never seen a miracle. To me, this was like a fairy tale. It was all in the realm of the imagination. The first time I ever saw a miracle, I was in a Catherine Kuhlman meeting. I was in the choir. I heard that there were going to be miracles. I didn't know what a miracle looked like, so I wanted to be close to the stage. The way to be close to the stage was to join the choir. So I joined the choir, and I was a part of the Catherine Kuhlman Choir there in Tulsa, Oklahoma. 
and I was sitting there when suddenly the power of God began to sweep through that auditorium. It was like electricity began to move from one end of the auditorium all the way to the other end of the auditorium, and people began getting out of wheelchairs, and blind eyes began to open, and miracles began to happen right in front of my eyes. And I remember my first thought. I thought to myself, why have I never seen this in my life? Why was I always told this was not true? Right in front of my eyes, Jesus in the Gospels stepped out of the pages of the Gospels and stepped into that auditorium. It left the realm of the imagination and it became bona fide. It became guaranteed, verified, authenticated, concrete right in front of me. I saw Jesus, the miracle worker. It was no longer something imaginary. I saw it. I knew Christ on a new level because of the gift of working of miracles. In my own personal case, I've seen the healing gift in manifestation. I've seen the working of miracles, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, healing, all these gifts of the Holy Spirit in operation. And now when I read the Gospels, it's not difficult for me to understand what Jesus was doing. It's not hard for me to understand what it was like when Jesus cast out a demon. I've seen demons cast out. I've cast them out. The gifts of the Holy Spirit bring us Christ on a practical level. They empower us to know Jesus on a higher and finer dimension. And again, there's a whole element of Christ that is missing where the gifts of the Holy Spirit are absent. It's wonderful to have information, wonderful to have instruction, wonderful to have doctrine. We need to have knowledge. We need to have all the knowledge we can get, but we need the practical work of the Holy Spirit among us to bring all of it out of the realm of the mind right into our midst. And that is what 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 6 says, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed among you. Again, the word testimony, the Greek word marturios, it means a first-hand account a personal witness. When the gifts of the Holy Spirit are working among you, you no longer have to operate on hearsay information. You don't have to operate just on what you read in a book, but you can speak from your own heart, from your own life, a first-hand account. You become a real witness of who Christ is because the gifts of the Holy Spirit have made him concrete or have established him, or as the King James Version says, have confirmed who he is among you. Do you see how important are the gifts of the Holy Spirit and why they are not optional to the church? A church that considers these to be optional is missing a dimension of Christ. We have to embrace the grace of God and allow the grace of God to bring the testimony of Christ to us through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now somebody may say, well, I'm a little bit afraid of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I'm afraid that we'll get into excess or I'm afraid that we'll be imbalanced. How many gifts are too many? How many gifts are too many? When do you pass that moment when you've left what is moderate or balanced and you become excessive? Well, notice what Paul says in the next verse. In verse seven, he says, so that you come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this statement, Paul tells us that the church of Corinth lacked no gift. They were overflowing with spiritual gifts. Paul was not concerned they had too many. And in fact, really in this verse, he's commending them for the fact they've been so open that now they come behind in no gift. They are overflowing with every known manifestation of spiritual gifts. And he says they are to operate in the church until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we're out of time. But this is where we're going to pick up when we come back in the next program. I'm praying that these teachings on the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit and why we need them is beneficial for you. But today as we close, I want to tell you that if you need prayer, we're here for you. We would love to pray for you. If you'll use the information on the screen to contact us, Denise and I and I prayer team, we'll get right to prayer on your behalf. We promise you that. But in closing, I want to remind you of Ecclesiastes 8.4. It says, where the word of a king is, there's power. Let the Word of God release its power in your life today, and I'll see you in the next program. Why We Need the Gifts of the Holy Spirit is a new read book by Rick Renner that clearly unfolds the truth that the book of Acts is filled to overflowing with the supernatural work of the person of the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, 
they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. As a result of that powerful experience, thousands of people got saved. As Rick explains, the book of Acts is not just a history book. It's a pattern book designed to reveal a pattern of what the church is to look like in the earth as we work with the Holy Spirit to release what He has placed inside us. The truths contained in this book will help you open your heart to allow the gifts of the Spirit to manifest through you on a deeper level than ever before. In his CD message, Why the Gifts of the Holy Spirit are Essential for You and Your Church, Rick Renner explains why 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7, says the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. That means it is for our good to learn how to work with the Holy Spirit. In order to be truly effective and supernaturally strong to build the kingdom of God and to win the lost in this crucial hour, the church must have a dynamic collaboration with the person of the Holy Spirit and give place to His gifts and operations. This message is our special gift to you this month. Visit our website at renner.org to download this free audio message along with a PDF of corresponding study notes to help you dig deeper into the Word of God. Dear friends and partners, my name is Joel Renner, and I want to share with you today just one facet of our ministry. Besides pastoring the Moscow Good News Church here in Moscow, Russia, Rick and Denise, my parents, maintain a very active public ministry. They travel all over the globe, spreading the good news about God. Their itinerary takes them to churches from coast to coast, where they are thrilled to meet new partners for the first time. And of course, they are so encouraged by the familiar faces of the longtime supporters of our ministry. Rick and Denise prize every opportunity the Lord opens to them to teach and preach the gospel and strengthen God's people. Their goal is to fortify the foundation under those they minister to so that they can build their lives on that foundation and prosper for God's glory. My parents desire to present everyone God allows them to influence, mature and complete before His presence. And just one way that they are doing that is by traveling all over the globe teaching God's Word to the people who are ready to listen. Thank you for helping us so we can help others. Rick Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the Word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity.